In male gay relationships, there is a huge amount of promiscuity and very little monogamy and fidelity. It's, it's virtually non-existent in the male homosexual community. Many lesbian relationships are plagued by domestic violence and psychological issues. Both the boys and the girls raised in gay homes were more likely to experiment with homosexual behavior. Gay marriage and gay parenting really boils down to two critical words. I want. It's not about what little Parker wants. It's not about what he desperately needs. It's about what Rosie and her lesbian partner, Kelly, want. Welcome to Pure Passion. I'm Jason Graves, the host of today's program. If you're a fan of Focus on the Family radio program, you have undoubtedly heard the voice of today's guest but may have never seen his face. I'm talking about Dr. Bill Meyer. Dr. Meyer is an author, speaker, and vice president at Focus on the Family. He hosts the national weekend magazine radio program and the Family Minute with Dr. Bill Meyer. His TV news feature on marriage and parenting can be seen in television markets across the country. And he is co-author of the book, Marriage on Trial, The Case Against Same-Sex Marriage and Parenting. We caught up with Dr. Meyer at a Love One Out conference in Orlando, Florida, and asked him a number of questions about homosexuality. With skills both clinical and theological, Dr. Meyer shared a good deal of insight and advice that will help you steer clear of all the media hype and misinformation that surrounds the subject of homosexuality in our culture. If you think about it, marriage has always meant the bringing together of men and women to commit themselves to each other and to commit to bringing out the next generation in a cooperative way. And if you look at any society anywhere in the world, no matter if you're talking about the tiniest little island in Polynesia, the remotest part of Siberia, you're not going to find a society where the basic family unit is headed up by two men or two women. It just doesn't exist. It's a very radical proposition. But in the last few years, just really in the last 10 years, there have been a few nations, mainly in Western Europe, Canada, and certain states here in the U.S., that have dared to suggest that we can take the family and we can refigure it, we can dismantle it. I, I kind of call it the, the Play-Doh view of marriage. We can take that piece of Play-Doh that is marriage and we can squish it and reshape it, reform it into something it has never been and not suffer any negative consequences. But the fact is, marriage is the way it is for a reason. Because children need mothers and fathers. Because the marriage is that glue that keeps men and women committed to each other so that they raise their common offspring. And gay marriage completely destroys that. And that's why I refer to it as a radical redefinition of the human family. In Genesis 127, uh, God is very clear with us that he created human beings in his image, male and female, he created them. In other words, he didn't just create men, he didn't just create women, he created co-humanity, those two separate parts of humanity that together demonstrate the full uh, nature of God. Just as God is relational, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, He made us relational. And the, those two genders, the, the co-humanity uh, of human beings, really demonstrates, just really demonstrates part of God's image in us. If you look then in, in Matthew, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And, and what does he say? He repeats that verse from Genesis 1.27, that God made them male and female in his image. But then he also goes on to say, and for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and unite with his wife and the two will become one flesh. Now in that verse, Jesus is giving one of the most incredible apologetics for marriage that you'll ever see. You'll often hear gay activists say, well, Jesus never talked about homosexuality in the Bible. Well, of course that's true. He never specifically addressed homosexuality. He never talked about you know, child sacrifice or domestic abuse either, but we can safely assume that he was opposed to those things. So it's really an argument from silence. But he did talk about marriage very clearly here. And for those gay activists who will say, well, there's no problem with gay marriage uh, biblically. Uh, it's very clear here that Jesus says there's a big problem with it because marriage is about men and women committing to themselves for life.
First of all, we know that God, when he created the two genders, he created us very differently, even physiologically. Take the human brain, for example. Uh, you talk to any neuroscientist, and, and you look at a scan of the human brain, a male brain versus a female brain. You'll find that they are different structurally, they're different functionally, they light up in different places under stimulation. The two genders are very, very different. And it's that differentness, that diversity, that complementarity that God had in mind. And that's why male-female unions work, where male-male and female-female unions don't. Uh, unfortunately, the research would tell us that within gay relationships, and this is not commonly known in our society, in male gay relationships, there is a huge amount of promiscuity and very little monogamy and fidelity. It's, it's virtually non-existent in the male homosexual community. Well, some people might say, well, what about lesbians? So I know this nice lesbian couple that uh, stayed together for, for 20 years. Why shouldn't they be able to get married? One of the things that the research shows about lesbianism is that many lesbian relationships are plagued by domestic violence and psychological issues. Um, in fact, uh, there's one lesbian author that refers to domestic violence as the dirty little secret of the lesbian relationship. Does it surprise us if God intended for marriage to be those two complementary sides of humanity, male and female, coming together intellectually, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, if that's what God had in mind, if that was his design for human beings, and then we distort his design, we, we basically thumb God in the eye and say, no, we're, we're, we're not going to take your design. We're going to do it our way. We're going to pursue what we want. We're going to have homosexual marriage. Should it surprise us that we're seeing all this dysfunction? The Netherlands, we know the research shows that, unfortunately, uh, homosexuals have a huge rate of psychiatric illness, drug and alcohol abuse, suicide attempts. There's a lot of issues there, and the Netherlands is the most gay-friendly country on the face of the planet. Gay activists will say, well, these problems are due to social stigma against homosexuals. But the Netherlands doesn't have social stigma. In fact, these researchers said, we can't figure out why there's all these problems in the gay community because we're very accepting of homosexuality in the Netherlands and we have been for years. Again, it's because God's design is being distorted. God's design is being twisted and manipulated. And, and so we are bearing the fruit of that. That's what we're seeing with gay relationships and with gay marriage. There's other research from the Netherlands, again, a very gay-friendly country, that shows that the average male gay relationship lasts about 18 months. The total length of the relationship is one and a half years. And during that time, uh, the average committed gay couple has an average of eight outside sexual partners. So you can see that monogamy and fidelity are simply not part of the male homosexual culture. Very few Americans know that because our media does a wonderful job of painting uh, gay relationships as idyllic and long-lasting and fulfilling. And when we see the images of all the gay couples in California uh, getting married, the, the media always focuses on the, the few relationships that seem to be healthy, long-lasting. But when you look beneath the surface, what you really find is that many of those relationships are plagued with a wide variety of problems, and it's not a pretty picture. Rosie O'Donnell is in a lesbian relationship with her partner Kelly, and the three of them have adopted three children together. Uh, about four years ago on ABC's television show Primetime, uh, they did a special on gay adoption, and it was basically Rosie's uh, coming out party. It's when she first publicly announced uh, that she was gay and that she was in this gay relationship and talked very glowingly about her relationship with her partner Kelly and the, those three kids they've adopted. Well, during the interview, Diane Sawyer asked Rosie if her then six-year-old son, Parker, ever asks why he can't have a daddy. And Rosie said, oh yeah, all the time. And Diane Sawyer was, I think, surprised by this admission on national television. And she said, well, what do you say to him? Well, when Rosie's son asks her, why can't I have a daddy? Rosie says, she tells him this, Parker, you can't have a daddy because I'm the kind of mommy who wants another mommy. If you think about it, gay marriage and gay parenting really boils down to two critical words. I want. It's not about what little Parker wants. It's not about what he desperately needs. It's about what Rosie and her lesbian partner, Kelly, want.
And little Parker doesn't lie awake at night wishing that the state would legally recognize Rosie and Kelly's relationship. He doesn't lie awake at night wishing that, that Rosie and Kelly could share social security benefits. He lies awake at night wishing he had a daddy. And it's now four years later uh, since that ABC primetime show aired. And in a recent interview, Rosie admitted that Parker, who's now 10, continues to ask, why can't I have a daddy? My perspective is that a, a just, compassionate society like ours should always come to the aid of motherless and fatherless families. But a just, compassionate society should never, ever intentionally create motherless or fatherless families. And that's exactly what same-sex marriage does. You know, we don't have a lot of hard data on, on gay parenting because it's a relatively new phenomenon in our culture. And the research is plagued by a lot of methodological problems. For one, you may have, let's say, a, a woman who's married, has a couple of kids, decides to divorce her husband and move in with her, her lesbian partner. Now, if you look at those children, they are not only impacted by the initial divorce and having their father out of the picture or in a non-custodial role, they're also impacted by being raised by two women. So how do you tease those things out? A lot of the gay parenting research is plagued by those problems. But we do have a few research studies that have tried to compare kids raised in gay homes versus kids raised in straight homes. And uh, Judah Stacy and Timothy Biblars, who were at the University of Southern California, uh, did research that was published in the journal American Sociological Review. And they looked at 21 of the major studies on gay parenting. They tried to tease out any statistical problems. They tried to, to really crunch the, the numbers. And what they found is they did find there were some, some significant differences in these kids raised in gay homes versus kids raised in straight homes. For one, the children raised in gay homes tend to be confused about their gender identity. Um, what does it really mean to be male or female? Uh, what does it mean as a little boy to grow up to be a man or as a little girl to grow up to be a woman? They really didn't understand that. They seemed confused about gender. Another difference, the girls were more promiscuous. Now, Stacy and Biblars, who are pro-same-sex marriage and pro-same-sex parenting, they say, well, you know, the girls were just more sexually adventurous. They weren't as chaste. Well, that's their spin on it. The, the research shows clearly the girls were more likely to be promiscuous. And the third difference they found, and the one that troubles me the most, is that um, both the boys and the girls raised in gay homes were more likely to experiment with homosexual behavior. That's not that they would ultimately self-identify as gay as adults, but they were more likely to try it out. They were more likely to experiment as teenagers and young adults with gay relationships. And I think if the average American knew that, they would be very, very concerned about gay couples raising children. But of course, the average American doesn't know that because you're not gonna see that on the CBS Evening News. You're not gonna read about it in the New York Times. And uh, that, as a psychologist, that really troubles me. Are you experiencing unwanted same gender attractions? Do you constantly find yourself wishing that you didn't have these feelings towards members of your own gender but can't seem to control them? Well, the good news is you're not the only one and there is hope. Personally, I've dealt with these same unwanted feelings towards other guys most of my life and I know how frustrating it can be trying to rid yourself of them and live a life that doesn't give in to these ungodly desires. God's word has been very encouraging to me when it says, there's no temptation that sees you except what's common to man. And there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you would, I'd like to share a few principles and tips that have helped me in my own journey to give you some of that same hope and help. The first thing I had to realize was that these unwanted attractions and feelings didn't have to have so much power over me. I didn't have to see that as my identity because humans are more than just our sexuality and feelings. I don't have to listen to the lies that say, you're gay or you're born this way. Instead, I can acknowledge that those feelings and attractions may amount to an orientation and that may even have crossed over into behavior at one point or another, but that doesn't change who I am as the person God created me to be. Next, we have to realize that this is more than just a spiritual matter. 
The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, Be sanctified body, mind, and spirit. So, I had to stop thinking I could just pray this away, or that by just reading my Bible more or talking to my pastor, I wouldn't have to deal with it anymore or as much. Well, all of these have been good and helpful solutions, but I do include more than just spiritual approaches. In fact, there are things that we can do for our bodies, our minds, and hearts that help the growth process. Physically, uh, we need to take care of ourselves. Often, we accept things into our body and life that amount to junk food. Self-care dictates that we do things like exercise regularly and plan adventurous fun into our schedule that gets ourselves out of our normal routine and restores our sense of excitement and well-being. Making sure to get enough sleep and eat right with a balance of protein and carbohydrates also helps to feel balanced. Sometimes, if we're experiencing a chemical imbalance at the brain level, we need to consider taking things like supplements and or herbs if necessary. Uh, see our doctor about prescription medication to control our mood, uh, overcome impulsivity, and ease irritability. All things that left unchecked can tend to take us in a direction we don't want to go sexually and relationally. Now, mentally and emotionally, it can be helpful that we connect with a therapist who specializes in unwanted same-gender attractions to help expose things like unhealthy thinking and relationship patterns, family of origin issues, and faulty coping methods. A good therapist can function as an advocate and a guide, giving us perspective and objectivity in their support and feedback, as well as ideas and things to try. Additionally, committing to a group of people from your same gender who also struggle with lust issues can be very helpful. I know this can be scary, but think about this. If everyone else there is struggling with the same kinds of things as you, what in reality is the likelihood that you'll actually be judged or put down? It seems pretty low, doesn't it? So take the risk and give it a try. And if you don't have a local group, try a teleconference group where you can connect over the telephone with one. Now, these tips are all a start to overcoming unwanted same-gender attractions, but there is certainly much more than is possible to address this exact moment that's needed in order to overcome. So, for more information, visit us on the web at purepassion.us, where you can find links to people who can help. Well, I hope this helps you and brings you hope today. Remember, managing unwanted same-gender attractions involves thinking accurately about the nature of the problem and addressing it holistically in our bodies, our minds, and our spirits with the help of a therapist and a group. So, be strong and be persistent. And don't forget, if thousands of people in recovery like me can live in victory with God's help and the help of other warriors, so can you, my friend. So until next time, I'm Jason Graves with tips for hope and healing for Pure Passion Television. In the debate over legalizing same-sex marriage uh, in California, in Massachusetts, uh, currently in, in Florida, um, one of the things you often hear from gay activists is that, you know, we should get the same rights and benefits that heterosexuals get. I call it the goody argument. They say, well, if you get these rights and benefits, we, sh we should get them. It's only fair. But what many people fail to realize is that the reason that society gives benefits to married couples is that marriage itself gives back to society in some remarkable ways. And we have thousands of research studies that show us that marriage benefits men, women, children, and society. There's no evidence that homosexual relationships would provide all of those wonderful things. In fact, in many ways, gay relationships are qualitatively different than heterosexual relationships, as evidenced by the research that we see out of the Netherlands. So for a gay activist to claim, hey, if you let us get married, that our marriage is going to bring these same good things to society, it's not based in fact. There's no evidence that that would occur. Society benefits when a man and a woman come together commit themselves to each other in marriage, commit themselves to raising their children, and provide them with the wonderful qualities that are uniquely male and uniquely female, because mothers and fathers parent differently. So when you hear that argument that we should get the same goodies, it's really based on a selfish, self-serving motivation, not this will benefit or help in any way uh, our greater society. 
heterosexual marriage was established by God. Genesis 1.27 tells us this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now we could take a whole seminary course to unpack that particular uh, verse there, but let's just, let's just focus on the second half of that statement for a second. God created human beings as two distinct complementary genders. Two distinct complementary genders. Some theologians actually like the, to use the word co-humanity when describing God's creation. In other words, he created us male and female, and at, just as God is relational, uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he created us as relational beings, and a major way that relation, that relationship or that relational nature uh, plays itself out is in the marriage relationship. Now, Jesus made this really clear to the Pharisees in Matthew 19. He said this, Haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female and said this, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one. Now here, Jesus very clearly and powerfully spells out God's intent for marriage. God created human beings as male and female. Marriage unites those two complementary sides of humanity into one flesh. How many have read anything by C.S. Lewis before? Many of you have. The Chronicles of Narnia or um, one of his marvelous apologetics texts. Uh, I didn't realize this, but in the book Mere Christianity, uh, C.S. Lewis actually talks about marriage. And here's what he says. The Christian idea of marriage is based on Christ's words that a man and wife are to be regarded as a single organism, for that is what the words one flesh would be in modern English. And the Christians believe that when he said this, he was not expressing a sentiment, but stating a fact. Just as one is stating a fact when one says that a lock and its key are one mechanism, or that a violin and a bow are one musical instrument, the inventor of the human machine was telling us that its two halves, the male and the female, were made to be combined together in pairs. Not simply on the sexual level, but totally combined. I love that analogy of the, the violin and the bow. If you think about it, um, how many have been to a symphony orchestra before at some point? Many of you. You, you go into that, that orchestra hall and you see all of those musicians up there on the stage in their various sections. And typically the string section is towards the front, and in the front of the string section you have the first violinist. That's the, the most competent, experienced violinist that leads the, the violin section. And the, uh, the maestro, the conductor, walks up to the podium, you know, he, he raises his baton into the air, and voila, beautiful music happens. Unless it's a junior high orchestra, in which case you never really know what you're going to get there. But, but think about it, think about the violin, that beautiful Stradivarius violin. It cannot be completed by another violin. And the bow cannot be completed by another bow. The violin needs the bow, and the bow needs the violin, and together they fulfill the purpose for which they were created. And that's what C.S. Lewis is saying here about marriage. You know, it really doesn't matter whether gay activists succeed in manipulating the culture to call gay relationships marriages, because government cannot redefine what God has already defined. Marriage has always been and always will be the union of one man and one woman under a covenant designed to last a lifetime. It's the bringing together into one flesh again, the male and the female, that were separated at creation when God brought forth Eve from the side of Adam. No one can redefine reality. The best they can do is pretend that they've redefined it. But let's pretend is a game for children. For those who struggle with attractions to the same gender, God has provided a way for you to find that union with another that He created you to have. His way is to heal the traumas, the neglects, the absences, or whatever else may have been the cause for your homosexual confusion. Yes, He wants to heal you just like he has hailed countless millions who have turned to him for healing. And if you're so advanced in age that there may not be enough years for healing to fully occur, he has ways of rewarding your pursuit of a goal not fully realized during your lifetime. There was an entire list of people named in Hebrews chapter 11 who God considered heroes, even though they never fully realized their goal while on earth. 
you'll never regret turning your life over to God and living in obedience to His design. He will always turn things to the good for those who love Him. Always. So, turn to Him today. Give up the pipe dream of gay marriage. It's a dead-end street that will only end in heartbreak, as the statistics for longevity in gay marriages have already proven. Give your life to the lover of your soul. His name is Jesus, and He wants to love you more than you'll ever know. None of your sinful choices have ever changed that fact. He still wants to rescue you from a lifestyle that only brings death. But it's up to you. He'll never force you to believe in Him and His love for you. But He has clearly demonstrated that love on the cross. I pray that you will choose Jesus today. So until next week, I'm Jason Graves for Pure Passion, wishing you the wisdom that brings eternal life. God, the steps I'm taking.